Well, let's look into God's Word together and uh, the book of Psalms, if you would take your Bible and open to the Psalms. And tonight I want us to look at Psalm 139, one of uh, our very favorite Psalms, Psalm 139. I've entitled this, uh, Our Intimate God. So some of you are astonished that we move that many Psalms forward. I want to assure you we will come back and uh, pick up the Psalms that we have passed. But tonight, I, I just want to encourage you tonight. Uh, I, I'm directed to not only the truth here, but the tone of this Psalm, and I want to bring this Psalm to you tonight. I want to begin by asking you this question. Do you ever wonder just how in touch God is with your life? Now, there are approximately six billion people on the planet and our planet is but one of billions of planets in the galaxy. And so, just how well does God keep up with your life? Uh, are you just a statistic? Uh, are you merely an insignificant speck on this planet that is spinning through space? Uh, are you really important to God? With everything going on in the world today, has God thought of you today? Uh, has, does God care for you, and has He demonstrated this care towards you today? I want to give you some good news tonight. God is intimately involved in your life. He is personally involved in every aspect and every dimension of your life. He is closely connected with you. He is vitally interested in everything that is going on in your life. There is nothing in your life with which God looks upon it with disinterest. In fact, God is so involved in your life, it is as if you are the only person upon this planet, and He is riveted and He is fixed upon you as if He has no one else to care for and to watch over. God is focused upon you. God is infinite, and so He possesses an infinite capacity to manage and to care for our lives. Tonight we want to look at Psalm 139, and there is no other psalm in all of Scripture which so uniquely conveys this truth that God is intimately involved with our lives. Psalm 139 is a psalm written by David, and it is an intensely personal psalm which expresses David's awe that God knew him even down to the minutest detail. Tonight, as we look at this psalm, and just to give you a, an overview of this psalm, there are four chief thoughts that I want you to see in this psalm. And I believe it will be a great encouragement to your heart tonight. In verses 1 through 6, we see that God knows me intimately. And in verses 7 through 12, we see that God is with me closely. And then in verses 13 through 18 that God made me uniquely. And then finally, verses 19 through 24, God defends me personally. Let's begin in verse 1, that God knows me intimately. Let me begin by just reading these verses for you, which uh, are verses I trust you are very familiar with. O oh Lord, You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. This is the doctrine that is referred to as God's omnipresence. That, excuse me, God's omniscience. God's omniscience. That God knows everything immediately, perfectly, and equally well. To put it in the vernacular, God is a know-it-all. There is nothing that God does not know, and this is very personal. It's not just that there is nothing that He does not know, uh, with the planets and the galaxies, but to make this personal for your life tonight, there is nothing that God is not intimately aware of in your life tonight. 
As we look at verses 1 through 6, I want to give you some, some handles, some subpoints here that I think will help open up this, this wonderful section. The first thing I want you to see about what God knows, number one, He knows what I am. That's verse 1. O oh Lord, You have searched me and known me. He knows what I am. He knows my character. He knows my essence. He knows my being. He knows what I am. In fact, this word searched uh, means to explore, to spy out. It was used of Joshua and Caleb when they were sent into the promised land to spy out the land. That's how intimately uh, aware God is of every detail in our life. It's as if He is constantly exploring our lives and spying out all that is transpiring beneath the surface in our life. The word was also used to dig deeply in a, in, a, in a gold mine where you would dig down to get to the bottom of, of what lies hidden beneath the surface. This is how penetrating and how searching God's knowledge is of us. Now, there is nothing that is hidden from His sight. And this is intended to be encouraging, not frightening, but encouraging that there is nothing that God is not aware of in our lives, whether it be our hurts, our discouragements, our disappointments. God knows all that is going on within our soul and in our heart. And he says, you have searched me and known me. And this word known uh, is a Hebrew word which means to know intimately, to know experientially, uh, as opposed to just to know something clinically or objectively, what God knows about us, He knows because He is so intimately connected with the very essence of who we are. So God knows, number one, what I am. Second, what I do. Look at verse 2. You know, when I sit down and when I rise up. Stop right there. What we have here is a, a figure of speech that is intended to convey the idea from Alpha to Omega, from the beginning to the end. He says, when I sit down and when I rise up, and that's a way of communicating all of our activities. Uh, God knows everything that we do. Uh, I don't know what you do all day, and sometimes when I meet a man, one of the first things I'll ask him uh, in conversation, tell me, what do you do? Uh, I don't know everything that you do. You don't know everything that I do. But God does. God knows everything that you do. All of your activities are an open book to God. And then third, not only what I am and what I do, but also what I think. Look at the end of verse 2. You understand my thought from afar. Uh, God knows all of my thoughts all of my attitudes and all of my uh, ambitions and all of my thoughts, uh, which are unknown to others, are perfectly known to God. Uh, others see my actions, but God sees my thoughts and my heart. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And in addition... Not only what I think, but where I go is known to God. Verse 3, you scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. No matter where I go, God is aware of where I am. I mean, I am under God's global positioning system constantly. And He, he scrutinizes my path. The word scrutinize... Uh, the idea here is to sift through something as one would winnow uh, grain and sort through it, to sort the, the, the chaff from the wheat, uh, the good from the bad. God is scrutinizing the events and the circumstances of my life. And He knows always not only what I think, but where I go. And again in verse 3, we see this, these two opposites. My, uh, you scrutinize my path and the idea of walking, but also my lying down. And so it's everything that's active, everything that's passive in my life. He is perfectly familiar with it. My path speaks of my public life. My lying down speaks of my private life. 
My path speaks of the daytime. My lying down speaks of the nighttime. My path uh, speaks of working. My lying down speaks of, uh, of resting. Every dimension of my life, wherever I go, God is intimately acquainted with all of my ways. He knows you inside out, frontwards and uh, frontward and backward. Everything about you, God knows. It really changes your prayer life once you come to understand that. That, that you're really not giving God updates in prayer as you pray to Him, as if we are informing Him uh, of something we do not know. Has it ever struck you that nothing ever strikes God? Uh, that God never learns anything? God is never surprised? So when we come to Him in prayer, it's time really to be authentic and genuine with God in prayer and not to even try to put a spin on the ball with God. We also see in verse 4, God knows what I say. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. So it's not only where I go and what I do and, and what I think, it's, it's what I say. In fact, God knows what I am going to say before I even say it. I'll go even further than that. God knows what I'm going to say before I even know what I'm going to say. How about that? And so God knows everything about my life. And the, the, the mouth is merely a window into the heart. Jesus said that man, uh, it is out of the abundance of the heart that man speaks. And so we can't even separate any of these verses one from another. It's just that God knows everything about our lives. And we see in verse 5 also, He knows what I need. Uh, you have enclosed me behind and before, and laid your hand upon me. And the idea is He has laid His hand upon me to be connected with me, to be identified with me, to help me, to sustain me, to guide me, to direct me. And He is very aware of all of my needs. He is aware of where He needs to lead me. He is aware of what He needs to provide for me. He is aware of everything that is going on in my life. And as we come to verse 6, it is David's response to this profound truth of verses 1 through 5. And before I read verse 6, I just want to tell you this very succinctly. Great theology always produces great doxology. Did you get that? The greater our understanding of theology will lead to the greater our worship of God. Uh, we are those who worship God in spirit and in what? And in truth. We can't worship God without knowing the truth. And the truth is powerful. The truth is dynamic. And so the more we understand of how God knows us, what I am, what I say, what I think, what I do, this truth pulls forth from our heart great worship of God from our soul. And so we read in verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. And that means it is so comforting to know that God is intimately aware of everything in my life. And because He is intimately aware, He stands on 24-hour call, constantly ready to meet these needs in my life, he is never off duty. He is, not to put it trivially, but He is always aware and ready to meet needs in my life. He says, it is too high, I cannot attain to it. He says, this is really mind-boggling. That He who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. He is always alert, always awake, always with His thoughts upon me, and always knows every aspect of of my life. What an encouragement this is. Sometimes when something breaks in our life, we can hardly wait to pick up the phone and call a close friend so that they can share this information. We can share it together so that they can encourage me or encourage you. We want them to know what's going on in our life because it provides strength for us, does it not? 
The longer we keep it to ourselves, sometimes the weaker we become. But it is a, a comfort to our hearts just for someone else to know what we are experiencing and going through. Well, think about this in relationship with God. We never have to even update God or be an informant to God regarding what is going on. He already knows. And we live in this state of constantly being the object of His His full attention and the awareness in our lives. So God knows everything about us. He knows what I am, what I do, what I think, where I go, what I say, what I need. And what is more, God always knows everything about us. May I also add, He never misunderstands us. And there are times you misunderstand me, and I wish it weren't so. And sometimes I misunderstand you, and I wish that were not the case. And we talk about, uh, on a horizontal base, the difference between perception and reality. And sometimes our perception of one another really does not match reality. And sometimes we come across in ways that we did not intend to come across. And so others see us differently than what we truly are. But do you know there is never any differentiation in your relationship with God between perception and reality? What God's perception is, is absolute reality in your life. We may be misunderstood by one another, but God knows the thoughts and intentions of our heart. And what an encouragement, even when others wrongly assume in what we did, that we may have meant it not in a positive way, but God knows the intention of our heart that we meant it even for good. So this ought to be a great encouragement to us tonight. Nothing catches Him by surprise. Nothing catches Him off guard. There is nothing unforeseen by God today that involves my tomorrow. He is able to manage my life today fully aware of what tomorrow will bring because He knows the future as equally well as He knows the present and the past. A.W. Tozier has written a book entitled The Knowledge of the Holy. It has a chapter on the omniscience of God. Allow me to share one paragraph with you in which Tozier wrote that God, quote, knows all that can be known. And this he knows instantly and with a fullness of perfection that includes every possible item of knowledge concerning everything that exists or could have existed anywhere in the universe at any time, in the past, or that may exist in the centuries or ages yet unborn. Here's a staggering thought. Not only does God know everything about your life tonight, but He also knows everything that would have happened had another course of events come to pass in your life. He has full knowledge of even all the, the infinite number of possibilities that would have come to pass had you taken this job, had you married this person, had you had these children, not had these children, every dimension, God knows everything, not only what does come to pass, but hypothetically could have come to pass, and yet was able to choose the one best plan and will for your life. You remember when Jesus said, well, if the miracles that I performed here would have been performed over there, they would have repented long ago with sackcloth and ashes. But it, those miracles never were performed over there. Why did not God have the miracles performed over there to bring about repentance? Because it was not a part of God's perfect plan. And so, Tozer goes on to say, because, because God knows all things perfectly, He knows no thing better than any other thing. So everything that God knows, He knows equally well. He doesn't know some things more than other things in your life. Everything He knows perfectly and infinitely. He never discovers anything. He is never surprised, never amazed. He never wonders about anything, nor, except when drawing men out for their own good, does He seek information. In other words, when we read in the Bible, when God asks a question of someone, it's not for God to obtain information. It's so that it will dawn upon the person who is being asked the question. 
the reality of what they are saying. So like a teacher would ask a student a question only so that the student would come to understand what is being asked, so God asks questions of those in Scripture and even of us through Scripture, not for him to obtain knowledge, but for us to obtain knowledge. God is self-existent and self-contained and knows what no creature can ever know perfectly himself. Even only God knows himself perfectly. So, what a, an auspicious beginning to this psalm. That God knows us intimately. And you know what? Despite your sin, despite your shortcomings, despite your failure, He knows all the record. He nevertheless still loves you perfectly. There is nothing that God will ever discover about you that He didn't know on the front end. He knows everything about you, not only the best about you, He also knows the worst about you. Those things that you wouldn't even want any of us to know about here tonight. And please don't tell me whatever those are. I love you, but not that much to want to know all of that. But God knows. And the one who knows you the best loves you the most. God loves you perfectly. And there's no skeleton that's going to come dancing out of a closet in your life that would turn the heart of God away as if He is not already aware of what has happened or is happening in your life. It's meant to encourage us. It's meant to convey how fully God embraces us in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how intimately aware He is of everything in our lives. Praise God He is that involved with us. But second, God is with me closely. Beginning in verse 7, we read, Where can I go from your Spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? These are two rhetorical questions implying a negative answer. The answer is nowhere. There is nowhere where I can go to escape your spirit. There is nowhere where I can flee from your presence. In other words, there is nowhere where God is not already present. So where could you go to escape God? Why would you even want to? You wouldn't want to. God is with you no matter where you go. But even if He wasn't with you, He's already where you're going. God is everywhere present. It is the doctrine of omnipresence. God is everywhere present with the entirety of His being. There is nowhere where God is only halfway present. God is everywhere present with the fullness of who He is. So we read in verse 8, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. Now, we, we can believe that, that God is in heaven. And so, when I die, or the rapture of the church, and I go to heaven, I will be with the Lord. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He goes on in verse 8 to say, if I make my bed in Sheol. Now, that's a euphemism for the grave. Behold, you are there. In other words, when I die, God will be there with me on my most difficult day. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Psalm 23, verse 4. And even as we face death, the Lord is with me. And even as I am laid into the grave, the Lord is with my body, as I, my spirit, will go into His presence to be with Him. And so there is a sense as we look at verse 8, my spirit will be with the Lord in heaven, my body will be with the Lord in the grave, every part of me will be with God even when I die. Then he says in verse 9, if I take the wings of the dawn, and the sun rises in the east. And what he is saying is if, if I could travel at the, at the speed of light in the direction of the east, no matter how fast I, could tra I should travel, there 
will never be anywhere I can go east. And remember, if you go east long enough, you're going to come back around the globe and come back to the west. And what he is saying is there is nowhere you can go but that the Lord will not be there with you. And he says, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea. If the, if the dawn is to the east, the sea is the Mediterranean Sea that is to the west. Heaven is north, the grave we could say is south, and what he is saying, north, south, east, or west. No matter where I go or what happens in my life, as a believer, the Lord is with me. Even as an unbeliever, the Lord will be there present. But how intimately He is with us who know Him. He goes on to say in verse 10, Even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. God will be wherever I go to provide positive direction into His will. He will still be in touch with my life. I am never beyond His reach, is what this is saying. You say, well, what, what about if I rebel against God? What about if God says, go Go west and I decide, or go east and I say, no, I'm going to go west. Well, you ask Jonah how that worked. God told Jonah to go west and he went and hopped a ship east. And he only found out that God was there in the storm and God was there on the sea. And that even when he tried to run away from God, he could not escape God because God is omnipresent. And what good news for us! That even in our times of, of spiritual decline, even in seasons of, of lukewarmness, the Lord is still with us. He is with us to turn us back to Himself. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And even when spiritually we, we become lukewarm, the Lord is still with us to stir up the embers, the embers of our heart that we would return to a passionate love for God. And so He is with us even when we are seem to be far away from Him. Nevertheless, He is with us. And He is also with us when we are walking with Him with a fervent, passionate, devotional love for Himself. So through thick and thin, the Lord is always with us. And in this sense, I do want to say, in the truest sense, you can never be out of fellowship with God. Now, I know there is a sense in which we can be, if we look at it in one dimension, that my heart would be away from God as if the appearance is that I have pulled out of fellowship with God, but in the truest, biblical, most theological sense, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we can never fall out of fellowship with God. Even when we are running away from Him and even when we are disobeying, he is still with us to turn our hearts back to Himself, to bring about repentance and confession of sin. God loves us too much to ever let us go. He says in verse 11 how God is with us even in our trials. He said, if I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Now, when we initially read this, we would say, oh, this is good news, God can see in the dark. Uh, I'm scared of the night and the dark, but God sees in the, in the dark, this is good news. Well, that is true. And what you cannot see in the dark, God can see. But there's more going on here than just a childlike uh, comfort here. When he speaks of darkness in verse 11, he is referring to more than the night time. He is referring to dark times, dark hours of the soul, dark trials through which we enter and experience I mean, that becomes clear because the second half of verse 11, he says, the light around me will be night. And he's talking about, obviously, more than just physical darkness and physical light. What he is saying is, is even when we are in those darkest times of our life, 
the light of God's countenance shines and He is with us when we go through the valley of the shadow of death. We could say when we need Him the most is when He is especially near to us. Dark times are not dark to God, is what verse 12 is saying. And this is far deeper than God has a flashlight and can see to get to your room when you're scared. What this is saying is, is that dark times when you cannot see your way, dark times when you are filled with fear, dark times when there is the encroachment of worry and anxiety around your soul, God can see the way out. God can see through those dark times. God knows the way that He has prepared for you. And He will lay His hand upon you and guide you and lead you even when you cannot see the way to take. He is right here with us to guide us through these times of darkness into the fullness of His will. And so this is intended to encourage us that God is always with us. I've shared with you before the first time I ever preached in my life. I was a freshman in college, and I spoke in that bustling metropolis of Fluvanna, Texas. Where? Fluvanna. I don't even know how to spell it from my notes. It's just Fluvanna. It looks like it's on the set of a John Wayne movie. It is out in Big Bend country. And I was dropped off there as a football player coming to give his testimony in a church. There was a Baptist church on one side of the road, a Methodist church on the other side of the road, and they had one preacher. And one week they met in the Baptist church, and next week they met in the Methodist church. I'm not kidding you. I met with the college department. Bruce, we met in the closet. It's where I met with them. And, uh, and no one went to college. They just stayed there and worked on the farm, and they were of college age, and it was a wonderful experience for me. And the pastor, when he came to introduce me to get up to give what I thought would be the prayer, he announced to this church of about 32 and a half people <laughs> that I would be bringing the morning message. I barely got out of high school speech class, and I was terrified. I didn't know what to say and had nothing prepared. And as I stepped into the podium, the only thing that I knew to say is that I was a long way from home. From Memphis, Tennessee to Fluvanna, Texas, there was a, several galaxies in between. <laughs> But as I looked at them, I could only say what was uppermost on my heart at that moment is that although I went, left Memphis and went to a college of some 25,000 people and I did not know one single human being on that campus. And as I felt so alone, And these were in the days when the phone was down at the end of the hall down by the men's room in the dorm. There was no calling home. All I could hang my soul on was that God was with me and that I would never be alone. You know, you can be in the midst of a group of people like this and feel very lonely. I want to encourage you The Lord is with you. And when we break up from here, you may go back to a home and be by yourself. But you won't really be by yourself. The Lord will be with you. Someone asked me the other day, what was the one thought that was on my heart as I stepped into the pulpit that last Sunday? And I said, this is the one thought that was on my mind as I stepped into the pulpit, is that there would be two people in that pulpit. There would be me, but more than that, there would be God. And God plus one always makes a majority. 
Whatever God calls you to do, God is with you. And He is with you to enable you and to equip you to do everything that He calls you to do. God will never throw you into the mix of anything and step, stay back on the shore with His arms folded and say, well, I sure hope you can swim today. If God throws you into the lake, I want you to know He's in that lake with you. And He is swimming with you. And He is bearing you up and strengthening you wherever He goes. Wherever He sends you, He is with you. You remember in Daniel chapter 4 when three young Hebrew boys named Heart Shafter and Marks. <laughs> I mean, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> they were thrown into that fiery furnace. That's about as tough a set of circumstances as I can, I can think of. I don't know that there's anything that I would rather not do more than to burn to death. And you remember when they looked into that fiery furnace, they said, what is this? We threw three men into the furnace, but there is now a fourth one as of the Son of Man. The Lord Jesus Christ was in that fire with them. They wouldn't bow, they wouldn't budge. Therefore, they would not burn because the Lord was with them. I want you to know the Lord is with you in your office. He is with you in your home. He is with you in your trial. He is with you in your dark night. He is with you when you're alone. God is always with you. And if God is with you, He is sufficient to carry you through. Now, I want you to see a third truth. As I look at this, I think we have seven minutes, and there's no way we can get through this, so let me just say that for whatever reason I want to say that. <laughs> I derive some strange pleasure. I want you to know that I know that you know that we, got, we can't do this, but we'll pick it up next time. <laughs> Was that Charles Allen? All right. That was Charles Allen that said that. Let the record show. All right. There's a third truth I want you to say, and I'll have to stop abruptly here in a, in a moment. But you can go ahead and write it down. God made me uniquely. Beginning in verse 13, we read, For you form my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. Now, just stop and think about that for a moment. I don't know that God could be any more involved with our lives than this. I'd say that's pretty personal. I mean, it's so personal, even as this is communicated to us, it's even in veiled language, so that we men don't, wouldn't faint when we read these verses. For you formed my inward parts. I was present for one of our four children's births. I was requested not to be at three of those <laughs> for obvious reasons. And for the one that I was present, I had my own nurse. Um, that is literally true. Some of us men are a little bit more sensitive than others. <laughs> well... For you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. That was God that was doing that in your life. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth, and that's a euphemism for the womb, the depths of the earth, in this very secret place, God was at work fashioning you and forming you. Your eyes, verse 16, have seen my unformed substance. And in your book were all 
written, the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. Extraordinary truth. Extraordinary. This is the doctrine of omnipotence. That God is all-powerful. Now, we've already seen that He's all-knowing and that He's all-present. This is that He's all-powerful. This is the third of the omni-attributes. We have seen that God is omniscient, that He knows everything, and that God is omnipresent, that He is all-present. This is that He is omnipotent, meaning that He is all-powerful. He is so all-powerful that God can create everything out of nothing. Now, you and I can move the dirt around a little bit and, 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 and make a sandbox, but we really didn't make anything because we didn't make it out of nothing. We just move around what God has already made. But God speaks everything into existence out of nothing. That is omnipotence. That is extraordinary power. And of course, I believe that in six 24-hour literal days, God spoke everything into existence that is in existence. And subsequently, each time there is a conception, it is the power of God put on display. As God powerfully creates human life at the very moment of conception, it is God who creates that heartbeat. It is God who creates that embryo. It is God who creates this person in His own image. That's how powerful God is. And so it begins in verse 13, and He says that God formed my inward parts. Literally, it is the word kidneys. Doesn't that do something for you right now? That God formed my kidneys. Now, He is conveying two truths to us right now. Number one, kidneys are symbolic of all my vital organs on the inside. Uh, the kidneys represent all of my other unseen organs, my heart, my lungs, my, my liver. God is the one who skillfully created everything that's on the inside of me so that I function very well. But I think there's more being uh, taught here. It's also symbolic of, of, my, of my inner personality, my inner emotions. And there are other passages of Scripture where kidneys represents the emotional life of a person. Uh, that you would feel something down in the very depths of your being. And the way the Hebrews would convey this is they would use the word kidneys, which is down there somewhere at the, at, in the middle uh, and at the base of, uh, of our torso. And it's there in, 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 uh, in that place that's represented here, my inward parts, is your temperament, your personality, uh, your sense of humor, or your lack of sense of humor, uh, whatever. But God made you unique, uniquely who you are. Not only your vital organs on the inside, but your personality, your temperament, your sense of humor. I think of our twin sons, Andrew and James. They came out of the same womb, and yet... And they are fraternal. They have totally opposite personalities. Why do they? Because one takes after my side of the family. <laughs> of course, the more astute child and the one who stubs his toe and runs into walls uh, favors Anne's side of the family. <laughs> That's God's doing. <laughs> Jacob and Esau. I mean, that, that is God's doing. And God has you uniquely made them to be them. And God has uniquely made you to be you. So don't try to be anyone else. You just be you. God has made you to be you. And He has wired you. Literally, He has wired you. Your emotional circuits on the inside... He, he has crafted you to function with your personality exactly as God has made you. So, for you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. And this word wove is, is a word that means to knit together. And it, it's the picture of someone knitting 
are weaving a, a, a beautiful tapestry that is a work of art to knit together skillfully, carefully, beautifully. God wove our inner parts together. Not only has He done that physically, He has done that emotionally. And he stops in verse 14. Remember I said theology produces doxology? He just has to stop in verse 14. We're not even at the stopping point in the psalm yet. But he just breaks forth and says, I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. The works that he refers to here are the works of creation, specifically the way he has made. Hey, listen, the next time you look in the mirror, you need to thank God. Now, you don't need to sing how great thou art, but you need to thank God and accept you for how God has made you because that's how God made you to look and to be. And you need to say, I will give thanks. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. How perfectly... According to God's design, you have been made. I think I need to stop right here because we'll have a hundred kids come running through here in a moment. <laughs> but let me just stop and say this, just to land this airplane. God is not merely high and lifted up on a throne. That He is but He is also intimately connected to your life. You want to know how close He is? He lives inside of you. You can't be any closer than to be inside of you. That's where He is. And so therefore, He knows you from the inside out. And He will never leave you. So wherever it is you go to tonight, He's on the inside of you and He is with you. He goes before you. He comes behind you. He is in you. You are encompassed with the presence of God. And He has so wonderfully made you that we give Him thanks. Now, what we will see next time is that as He made you, He also made a certain number of days for you to live here upon the earth. And that's all wired as well. And so if He gives you seven more days, you may come back and hear the rest of the sermon <laughs> next Wednesday evening. I thank the Lord for you, for God's hand upon your life for good, and for the way that He's at work in your life. I see God at work in your life, and it's a wonderful thing to see. As you are rooted in Christ, there is fruit that is being produced in your life, that is supernatural fruit, and only God could be doing that in your life. So may He continue to prune you and fertilize you and till up the soil of your heart. And as He does, may the sap of the Holy Spirit and the sap of His Word just flow into your life. And may you bear much fruit for His honor and for His glory. Let's pray. God, thank You for how personally involved You are in our lives. We often say that we have a personal relationship with You, and it's almost become like a slogan, almost. And it's good for us tonight to, to frame that and to clarify that. As we think of this personal relationship that we have with You, that we know You and that You know us, We've seen afresh tonight how intimately involved you are in every detail of our life. Lord, in the right sense, that encourages us to know that you would love us this much and that you are so sovereignly brilliant that you could micromanage your creation that you could micromanage our lives. And so we thank you for this. And I pray that you would encourage 
my brothers and sisters here tonight in their walk with you. And may they have high and lofty thoughts of you. And may they grow to see each passing day what is the height and depth and breadth and length of your love for them in Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. The following has been an audio recording of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church and is under the direct copyright of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church. All recordings may be used freely for the ministry and application of the Word of God. However, written permission must be obtained from Christ Fellowship Baptist Church before any recording is broadcast or redistributed in any form. In no way should this recording be disseminated without the express consent of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church.